Hey everybody! Today, Rado runs through his top 10 biggest disagreements with Board Game Geek, which probably deserves a little bit of an explanation. It might not be what you think that I'm going to be talking through here today. Specifically, there's a cool little feature on Board Game Geek that you can use if you rate a lot of the games in your collection. Basically, you can go to your profile and then go to stats and then choose largest discrepancy between your ratings and BGG. And I just did that the other day because I hadn't looked at it for a while, not since I did my top 10 overrated games. And I was just kind of curious to see um, just where I part ways with the Board Game Geek user base gestalt, uh, zeitgeist. And you know, I, I noticed, man, there are so many games that I just love to pieces that it seems like the greater geek community is giving the cold shoulder to, and it just kind of bothered me. Uh, and, you know, I could happily play any of these 10 games. They all rated 8 or above for me, which means I'm pretty much ready to play them anytime, anywhere, because I love them so much. And uh, But yet, you know, on Board Game Geek, their, their average is just down, 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 down. So... I just want to give them a little bit of time in the sun, and so we're going to be counting them down, starting with number 10, Habitats. I, 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 I don't want to become a broken record here, but I do not understand how this could be so low. I guess there's something to be said for, hey, it's the least uh, disparity between how I rated it. So I rate it really high, and Board Game Geek is rated it kind of high, but nowhere near as high as it should be, because this is an absolutely brilliant uh, a tile lane game. So much fun, so much tension, so much variety, so much replayability. It's absolutely brilliant. My best guess is it probably just hasn't gotten very wide distribution, because if more people played this, I think, on the whole, it would it would have to, uh, you know, climb higher and higher and higher in the ranks. But, you know, it came out in 2016. Oh, by the way, uh, one thing that is very important uh, that, that I should have mentioned right up front, I am ignoring games that have come out in the last couple of years, because they probably just haven't quite found their footing on Board Game Geek, so, you know, they're still uh, maybe shifting around. So this is from 2016 earlier, and, you know, Habitat just barely squeaks in. And, you know, it got a pretty small release, and although I remember Tom Vassell raved about it, and I never got around to getting it. I only replayed it for the first time this year when it went on Kickstarter a second time, and oh my gosh... It's so good! Watch my run-through. By the way, I've got run-throughs for every single game I'm going to be talking about today, because these are all games I absolutely love. Watch my run-through to find out why. Um, you know, Hopefully, as more and more people get their hands on it, it will start to rise, because it's such a brilliant tile lane game of building your own little animal refuge, your own little animal habitat, um, you know, full of trying to place tiles so they activate other tiles. I mean, this thing gives Glenn Moore a run for its money, quite frankly. It would easily make my top 10 tile end games, and it is so worth checking out. My number 10 biggest disagreement with Board Game Geek, Habitats. Now I've got my number 9, Bomb Squad. Now, I'll be honest, this one I understand a little bit more, because a lot of people are going to be implicitly turned off by co-op games. And so they'll rank it low for that. Ah, co-op, it's not even a game, which just boggles my mind, but whatever. Uh, but even more people are probably going to be put off by the fact that it is a, a real-time game. And for a lot of board game geeks, they want nothing to do with a timer that tells them how long or you know how short a time they have to think. You know, They come to board games so that they can ponder and muse and dig deep and as opposed to just go, 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 go. I mean, they don't want that kind of high velocity, high intensity kind of video game feel that a, that a really good real-time game can do. So, I mean, that's kind of a one-two whammy against it. And it's a real shame because this is such a cool, fun, fun game. Uh, you know, it is basically a real-time cooperative game of robot programming where we're all trying to get the same robot, bomb defusal robot, to make it in and take out bombs and rescue hostages and stuff like that. But... It uh, basically repurposes the core, I can't see my hand of cards, everybody else can, gameplay of Hanabi. And Jen, I thought it was just absolutely brilliant. Such a clever little, you know, building upon the shoulders of others to make something really new and fresh. But I get it. I see why it's not here. Again, co-op, real time. And then probably one of the highest pressure, um, you know, just really, really challenging uh, co-op real-time games out there. Uh, my number nine, Bomb Squad. Then we move on to number eight, Spirits of the Rice Paddy. Once again, what is up, Board Game Geek? This is such an incredible game. Uh, um, uh, uh, from, oh, uh, 
Oh, Phil Duberry. I was going to say Walker Hardy, but no. From Phil Duberry, uh, who's kind of a very, very well-loved, very well-respected designer. And this, um, the, you know, the, the gameplay here was incredibly sharp. I don't know. Maybe people were put off by the really kind of oddball nature of the gameplay where you are trying to manage the flow of water to flood your rice patties so that the rice grows, but then to empty it out so you can harvest the rice and then flood it again, all the while dealing with weeds and, and the spirits of the rice patties, these incredibly powerful god cards that we draft for. Jedi, we think it's a blast. Really, really sharp. Very, very thematic. Uh, and, um, you know, and really interesting. I guess... It's a little fiddly, to be fair, because of the nature of, oh, I got to take the, the, the waters represented by these tiles. And it was always kind of struck me as odd that they didn't actually inclu include, um, oh, what do you call them? Um, you know, clear plastic chits for the water. So you could see the stuff that's underneath. As it is, you kind of stamp the, you know, uh, uh, stack the rice, and then you put the water on top and you got to remove the rice and, and this and that. I guess maybe that's why it kind of got knocked down a little bit. I don't think that's really fair, but I could certainly see it. But man, it is such an unusual game. A really Really, really unique experience and a blast. Uh, my number eight, Spirits of the Rice Paddy. But now let's move on to number seven, Kashgar Merchants of the Silk Road. Whoa. What the heck, BGG? This is easily one of the best engine builder games on the market. It is one of the best deck builders on the market. It's a triple deck builder. Maybe that's... I mean, there's a lot of people who just vehemently refuse to even play deck builders amongst the geek populace, let alone consider them. And I don't understand that. That makes no sense to me. But even still, for uh, you know, for, for deck builder haters, this is a deck builder almost for people who hate them because you're building your decks face up. You have so much more control. There isn't the random draw. And it's such a brilliant engine game of trying to get three separate decks working in sync with each other. I don't know, I guess some people probably dismiss it because of its very dry subject matter. Yet another, um, you know, uh, you know, converting goods into points. It's kind of dry. I get that. But I don't care. It's so sharp, so smart. The first time Jen and I ever played this, we fell so hard in love with it. And I'm so glad it's finally this year gotten a big, nice reprint. Um, you know, or I should say, not a reprint, a, a, a proper English printing. I've gotten that one. And, uh, you know, instead of using my kind of jury rigged, uh, converted German one, it's so great. Again, maybe that's a problem. Like, um, you know, earlier with Habitats, maybe it just hasn't had a big enough audience because the publisher Cosmos decided to keep it only in German for years and years and years. Um, that it just kind of languished, so not very many people saw it. I can only hope it climbs because it deserves to. Kashgar, Merchants of the Silk Road is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But now let's move on to number six, Bonanza the Duel. And this is another one I guess I can kind of get. And remember, as we climb up, we're getting to bigger and bigger discrepancies. These are all eights and, or, and nines for me. These are all really, you know, cream of the crop as far as I'm concerned. And yet Board Game Geek just knocks them down. And, you know, the farther we get, the bigger the discrepancy is. So the more confused I am as to why these brilliant games wouldn't make it. But on to the duel... I can kind of give you that, you know, it's a, it's a card game and it's only for two players. That's probably going to turn some people off right there. I mean, they might just be inclined to knock it down because, oh, I, I, don't, I don't even consider playing a game if it doesn't support three or four. And, of course, Bonanza, for years, has been very well known and very well loved. I mean, a lot of people consider it to be designer Uwe Rosenberg's best game of all time. Even, you know, supplanting Agricola or Caverna or... Um, you know, uh, um, you know, all, all, all the really big popular games he's done over the last few years. A lot of people say, nope, he just should have stuck stuck with Bonanza and the fun, simple little card games he used to do. And Bonanza is always required. It's always been a game where the more players, the better, because there's so much trading and whatnot. Maybe people are dismissing it out of hands because they figure, well, there's no way you can get a good two-player Bonanza. That just makes no sense. And so they're banging it unfairly because I got to tell you, folks, this game is brilliant. It is so sharp. I mean, the core concept of Bonanza, you have your hand of cards. You need to play them uh, first in, first out. You cannot rearrange the cards, and that creates so much tension. But what actually struck me as really brilliant about Bonanza is, even though it's a two-player game, it finds a way to integrate players tr engaging in trade, which is something that normally never works in a two-player game. You never see it because of the zero-sum nature. But here it works great, and it introduces some very cool stuff that doesn't exist in the original game. 
It's the bee's knees. And I'm so sad in my move, my international move from Malta to America. I've lost my copy. i got to get another one because it's so great. And it so does not deserve to rank so, so low on BoardGameGeek. I uh, number six, Bonanza the Duel. Then we've got number five, Subdivision. Ugh! Now, this one, I'm not surprised it's here. But I don't understand why. I know this game gets so unfairly put down um, you know, and dismissed out of hand, even though it's such a brilliant game. It um, merges drafting. It's a tile drafting game, but it also brings in this kind of bingo concept where every round a die is going to get rolled that determines where everybody can actually place one of the tiles from their hands that they drafted for to build up a city or a, a little suburbia type area. Now, I know a lot of people just... Buried it in the dirt because it was effectively the the unofficial sequel to Suburbia, which is an incredibly popular, very very well loved tile laying game set. And you know, and, and um, you know, sub um, did I call it? Sorry, I meant Subdivision, the the game I'm talking about here. It kind of because it wasn't more Subdivision. A lot of people dismiss it. Hey, I wanted more Subdivision. What the heck is this thing? It's supposed to be the same, but it's so radically different. Bah, hate it. That's the best. I, I, that's my best possible explanation for why this thing gets so unfairly maligned. Because it's brilliant in a lot of ways. As far as I'm concerned, it's better than Subdivision. Don't get me wrong. I still rank Subdivision a bit higher. But you know, the more I play Subdivision, the more I, it's it's such a sharp game. So incredibly cool and fun and tense uh, with. Tons of replayability. I love the extra attention to detail that the last page of the rules lists like a half a dozen different variants that you can do to keep mixing things up. It's absolutely brilliant. If you have not tried it uh, over the years because you just know, you know, it, it's just common knowledge that oh, it's the it's it's suburbia's poor brother. Why bother to play that when you can play suburbia? Oh, you're missing out, folks. Subdivision is, mm, it's exquisite. Um, but let's move on to my number four. SOS Titanic. Now, this one's just heartbreaking. I guess it probably gets smacked around in the ratings because some people will just dismiss it out of hand as, oh, this is just Klondike Solitaire with, with the Titanic theme thrown on. How cheap. Yawn. Next. But uh, Bruno Cathala, you know, very hugely popular designer, I think he did a brilliant job taking the core precepts of Klondike style solitaire and enhancing it, building upon it by bringing the theme in. The theme fits so beautifully, this game of trying while the Titanic sinks to get all the lifeboats loaded up using the same basic rules as Klondike. You know how you're trying to, you know, make straights of, you know, seven, eight, nine, six, five, four, three, two, one. you know, I just did that totally wrong, but you get the idea if you played Klondike. Everybody's played Klondike at some point on their computer, right? It's, it's just been around forever. It takes those ideas that are rock solid, but adds special player powers um, and uh, you know and a really strong theme, and, and, and it tweaks the rules just a tiny, tiny bit and makes something really beautiful and and kind of moving too, because you know uh, the Klondike isn't the ultimate solitaire. Um, what do you call it? Uh, abstract card game. But you, well, if you're anything like me, you find yourself getting into it. It's um, be, you know, because the cards are not just numbered, you know, five, four, three, two, one. You're trying to put them out there. There are faces on these cards. And you know, every card that you can't get out there is somebody who's going to die. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit too heavy for some people. Maybe some people didn't like that. Maybe some people just dismiss it because it's a solitaire. Or the interesting thing is, I think the co-op rules for it work really, really well. But I know some people dismissed it out of hand and said, oh, this is just, uh, it's trying to be a co-op game and, and they fail at it, so mark it down. Maybe that's the issue. Or I'll be honest, maybe I'm artificially raising it. Because if you ever watched my run through for it, you know in my final thoughts I talked about how it had a very strong emotional impact for me because I, I used to, uh, I learned and used to play Klondike with my dad before he passed on and stuff like that, you know, growing up my whole life. So maybe I'm ranking it higher than I should, but I don't think so because it's an incredibly sharp puzzle game. I mean, there's a reason Klondike is on every single computer in the world. It's a brilliant, brilliant design. And so Bruno Cathala taking it and turning it into something more, something bigger something better uh it's, it ranks very highly in my regard and it should in yours i guess the other problem might be it had an incredibly tiny small print run and now it's disappeared forever no one can get their hands on it i don't know why that should mark it down but again getting back to what i said right front habitats maybe if it more people had had a chance to see how brilliant it is um that you know the the positive views would um outrank the lower ones i don't know 
It's a shame. It's on this list at all because it's brilliant. My number four, SOS Titanic. But now my number three, Apocalypse Chaos. Uh, I'm at my wit's end. I don't get it. Why don't people like this game? Um, you know, it's it's a brutal, very very challenging, cooperative game of survival. It's kind of like ghost stories on steroids. Um, in that we have to protect uh, this. No, it's not a you know a, a, an Asian village like ghost stories. It, instead, it's a it's a crashed spaceship. It's not you know, ghosts that are coming after us and, and scary monsters. Instead, it's it's unknown aliens that are just attacking us from all sides. And this is such a rich, complex, challenging puzzle to solve round after round um, because it gives you so much to grind on. There's really almost no random nature element to this game at all. There's a little bit when the, when the bad guys spawn, but once they're on the board, you know exactly what they're going to do. They're going to zig, they're going to zag. You have to be trying to think three, four, five, six more moves ahead. The game is also has great table presence because it actually is a 3D board. Not only are you protecting the ground floor, but the second, the third floor, and you can make different layouts for your uh, your crash spaceship. You're trying to defeat... I'm trying to think why would this get knocked down? Maybe because there's not enough randomness? Maybe because it's too cerebral? And and it's it's certainly very challenging. Don't get me wrong. It is I, To my way of thinking, it is a tougher puzzle to solve than... Um, Ghost Stories, which is often reg highly regarded uh, as like the toughest co-op out there. No, it's not. Apocalypse Chaos kicks its butt, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of the the you know the mental the gray matter you've got to burn to actually have a chance of winning. I you know, I don't know. Um, I know. I remember some people complaining about that it was maybe more dry. I mean, people complaining about oh, who are these aliens? I don't understand why I'm here. I don't really get a sense of thematic connection. <sighs> I don't know, I'm grasping at straws. I can't think of why Apocalypse Chaos didn't make more of a splash. I know one problem is it had the misfortune to be published by Z-Man uh, the same year, the same Essen it was launched as Pandemic Legacy Season 1. So, that was a tough act to follow and it just kind of disappeared. But even still, those who have played it should appreciate it more because it's brilliant. It's my number three, Apocalypse Chaos. Now, number two is a... Uh, actually, my number two... Parts 1 and 2, because I've combined them together. Peloponnese and Peloponnese the card game. Peloponnese is in my top 10 games of all time. And Peloponnese the card game, if it gets more expansions, might ultimately supplant it. But either way, they're both brilliant takes on the same core, wonderful auctioning system where you're trying to build a, you know an era of antiquity, civilizations, and survive round after round after round of crushing, punishing uh, disasters that you get ample opportunity to plan for. I mean, this is kind of like a quicker, more lean, streamlined, um, oh, in the year of the dragon, but run by auctions instead of, you know, action selection. It's absolutely brilliant. Like I said, it's in my top 10 games of all time, and I don't get it. I guess maybe, maybe it gets ranked down because the art is not very good. Fair enough. It's so-so at best. Maybe it gets um, knocked down because it is very harsh and very unrelenting. I mean, that harsh, unrelenting nature is what makes Jen and I love it so much. We love it when a good Euro just beats the crap out of us um, and you know, and, and gives us something really hard to try and, and scrabble and try to survive. I mean, there's so many games we absolutely love. I mean, we're, someday I'm going to do a top 10 um, uh, uh, games that proves that Jen and I are board game masochists because we just love a game that beats us up. We don't like beating each other up, but we love it when a game beats us up. And Pelep and its smaller brother, you know, the Plebanese card game, do that in spades. I don't understand. I mean, I mean, I guess there, you know, the discrepancy here is because I rank it so high as one of the best games of all time, as far as I'm concerned, it probably does a little bit better. But still, it, I don't even think it makes the BGG's top 100, and that's a crying shame because it's so good, Pelebanese. Uh, but my number one, oh boy. Uh, it's just depressing to see how many people fundamentally do not get Shadowrun Crossfire. Uh, my number two highest ranked game of all time. So again, that goes somewhat towards explaining the discrepancy. I rank it so high that if Board Game Beach says, eh, it's okay, it comes out with this big discrepancy. But still, it should rank so much higher on BGG. And I know why it doesn't. It's a, it's a cooperative deck builder, again... Um, you know, some people just dismiss it out of hand because it's co-op. Some people dismiss it out of hand because it's deck builder. You know, they just rank it down because of that. Because there's this kind of minority pushback against cooperative games or deck builder games. All right, you know, if it's not your cup of tea, well, this is kind of in the core why I'm so 
uh, disappointed by Board Game Geek's entire ranking system that actively encourages you to rake a game across over the coals because, oh, it's just not my kind of thing, so I should rank it really low because I personally would never want to play it. And so I'll give it a two or a three, when in fact that's not fair because that has no reflection on how good the game is. But I'm sorry, I'm not going to go down that road. If you want to hear more, you can go to faq.rado.com. I've talked quite a bit there about my uh, disapproval with the uh, Board Game Geek ranking system. Actually, that's what prompted me down this rabbit hole in the first place. Because in my last podcast, uh, or maybe it was my uh, Rambler Q&A, somebody asked about um, r rankings. And so I started thinking about Board Game Geek rankings, which I hadn't done for a while. And that led me here. And that led me to this top 10. But I'm sorry. Ah! Sorry. I'm here to talk about Shadowrun Crossfire. Although I've talked about it so much. Anyway. People might dismiss it because it's a co-op or because it's a deck builder. There's going to be some uh, core of that. Some people probably dismiss it because they really love the original Shadowrun uh, roleplay game universe, and this is a this doesn't is not a, an incredibly evocative and atmospheric game. It's a it's a very cerebral game. The theme is there, but you have to kind of go looking for it. It, it. The game's not dripping in themes, so some people dismiss it because of that. That's a shame. But I think more than anything else, people dismiss it out of hand because it is such a cruel and, again, unrelenting, unforgiving, challenging game. It really puts you through your paces. And I know a lot of people think the game is literally broken and unbeatable as is. And that's ridiculous. No, that's not ridiculous. It's, you know, I mean, people are entitled to their opinion. It's not fair for me to judge. But Jen and I know we have played it enough. It's uh, It made my top 10 most played games of all time. You really have to put the time in because the more you play it, the more you realize... When you play Shadowrun Crossfire, everything you know about trying to win a cooperative game, you kind of have to throw out the window. You have to the the winning strategies for that game are so unintuitive, and that's one of the reasons we love it so much. It really pushes us in different directions than other cooperative games we love do. And I'm just here to say, folks, there is a reason that the developers of the game, the original developers, they win 90% of the time. Even played as a two-player, they win in the high 80% of the time. That means it is not just random dumb luck as determines. If you lost, it's not because you were unlucky, or it's very unlikely. If you lost, it's more likely because you haven't mastered the brilliant, interesting, deep, and complex, and again, unintuitive, I can't stress that enough, unintuitive strategies that can lead to success. And um, because, and that's why Jen and I love it so much. It's so fresh, it's so different, and it, you know, it's so challenging. We love a challenge when we sit down to the table, uh, that we absolutely love it. And apparently it was just too challenging for a huge portion of the players who played it, and so they ranked it down unfairly, in my opinion. And what's interesting, Shadow and Crossfire is about to get a reprint, the Runner's Edition, and I have mixed feelings about that. I love, because it had a fairly small print run to begin with, so I love more people are going to get their hands on it, but as I understand it, the new version is going to be kind of watered down. It's going to be kind of nerfed. Uh, the uh, so A lot of the changes that they introduced to uh, to Dragonfire, which was the Dungeon and Dragon sequel that uses the same system, are going to be retroactively applied there. And I want to say I'm just not a fan of that. I'll, I will withhold judgment to see how the final thing comes out. I hope, 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 hope that the new reprint comes with a means that you can play the way the original designers intended. Because as I understand it, the new version has been taken over by other people who agree with the lion's share of Board Game Geek, who think it is too hard and it had to be you know, kind of straight-jacketed, and I'm not a fan of that. But again, we'll wait to see. It should be coming out any time now. But in the meantime, it is my number one biggest disagreement with the, uh, the hive mind of Board Game Geek the ranking of Shadowrun Crossfire. And that's it, folks. There is my top 10. There were plenty more besides. And when I get to my next uh, podcast, probably in November, because October is going to be a an Essen preview thing, I'll talk about all the other ones that are so unfairly ranked down, um, at least in my opinion. But hey, I'm just one guy. Uh, what do I know? Everybody, you know, they, you know opinions can't be wrong because they're very, very personal. But like I said, I was just looking at the list and I thought, wow, I really wanted to talk about it, and so I have. I've gotten it off my chest. Thank you for your patience, and thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.